here at Northern Stage, best job in the world, and I mean that sincerely. And uh, I mean it sincerely when uh, I just finished two and a half weeks of rehearsing with the most glorious cast of Boeing Boeing. I directed Boeing Boeing. So um, I'm a little nurse not too long ago. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Um, yeah, my little hat's all gone now. All that's gone. Um, I thought that dress was a little bit like a queechy balloon, but um, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was fine. So, uh, and I'm not Peter Sashio. I'm so sorry. There are days that I wish I was. Um, so, Boeing Boeing, uh, it was written by Mark Camilletti. He was born in 1923 and he passed away in 2003. He is a French playwright, but he was born in Sweden with Italian uh, origins in his family. And I think when you watch the show tonight, that internationalism uh, is very, very helpful as far as the show is concerned. Um, it is a translation, and it was interesting going through the process with the actors where uh, there were certain words that we thought, well, this just doesn't fit with how this feels or what the moment is. So we adjusted a, a few things. When he first wrote it, um, the story is of Bernard. He is an architect in the original uh, draft of the play. He's an architect in Paris. He's a Parisian. And he has uh, three fiancés. He has, uh, now in the original play, it was an Italian fiancé, a German fiancé, and um, a French fiancé. And he has a French maid by the name of Bertha. And in the play, uh, rather somewhat out of the blue, an old friend of his from school from 20 years ago shows up, and he was French. Well, the play was, uh, it, it, it was produced in London in 1962, yes, and ran for seven years. It came to the United States in 1965 and ran for 23 performances. And there's an interesting sort of uh, conversation on the internet about why maybe the Brits enjoy something like Boeing Boeing and titles like Run For Your Wife and Don't Dress For Dinner or No Sex Please, We're British. Uh, and why the Americans at the time didn't find it uh, as entertaining as the Brits did. And then uh, it saw a, a revival in London in 2007 and it was an enormous hit and I think it was because the director, Mark Wackus, uh, infused uh, a, a very interesting flavor of the character of Robert, the uh, gentleman that comes to visit out of nowhere, uh, with more of a silent, um, silent film star quality. There's a Harold Lloyd, Buster Keaton, sort of Charlie Chaplin-esque uh, flavor with Bernard, uh, sorry, with Robert. Um, so, it saw, this, uh, it saw this revival and then came over to the States and it was an enormous hit and won Tony Award for Best Revival. Mark Rylance, who played the role of Robert, uh, he won the Best uh, Tony for Best Actor. And where the play shifted, they've put now, it, it still takes place in Paris, but the two guys, the two lead guys, they are Americans and one of the stewardesses is American and the other two are still Italian and still German. And basically what happens in the play is Bernard has these three fiancés, they're air hostesses, we call them stewards or stewardesses now, and he has a very calculated timetable by which he spends three days with one stewardess, three days with another stewardess, and three days with another stewardess. And by virtue of technology, his plan starts to go awry or awry. Uh, turbo jets start to come into play in uh, aeronautics. And so the planes are coming and going much faster. And so the stewardesses are showing up much faster. And he has to, with Bertha and Robert, try and figure out how to manage these three fiancés uh, showing up at the same time. It's, it's worth mentioning it was a film in 1965 with Jerry Lewis and Tony Curtis. And I will talk about the casting of this play uh, in a little bit. Uh, but it was sort of like a buddy film. And I think this play does have that, a little bit of that quality of, 
Hope and Crosby or uh, Danny Glover and Mel Gibson in Le the Lethal Weapon series. These two guys, it's interesting, you'll see how, uh, how the shift of power happens between uh, these two and the contrast uh, between these two uh, characters. Uh, it is considered a classic French farce and this stunned me when I was doing my research earlier in the fall that in 1991 the Guinness Book of World Records noted that Mark Kamalefi is the single most produced French playwright in the world. And I thought Moliere must be rolling over in his prayer about that one. Um, and largely due to uh, Boeing Boeing. It has been produced in 55 different countries in as many languages. And um, I think it's because it's a, an extremely well-structured play. And um, I will talk about the structure uh, in just a second. And, and some of the things, or one thing that we did that we sort of amped up the structure a little bit. One of the reasons that it is considered a classic French farce, and there are some rules of the universe in good French farce. It takes place in one location, and here we are in Bernard's flat, and as someone mentioned as I walked in with a number of doors, and I just recently heard that there is a rule in farce that you always have to have one more door than the number of characters you have in the play. <laughs> so we have, we have six, we have seven doors. There's been a big debate as to whether or not the French doors count as one or two. <laughs> but in order to stay within the rules of six characters and seven doors, it counts as two. Um, the events of the play take place in less than 24 hours. It is entertainment by means of unlikely or extravagant, but often possible situations. And in farce sometimes, the possible situation does sort of creep into the improbable. And there, there's, part of me wants to give you an example of where you have to have, as an audience member, a willing suspension of disbelief but I don't want to call attention to it because you're going to see the show this afternoon, yes? And so I don't want to spoil where I think there is no way that would happen if that's happening. But I'm, so I don't want to... Uh, so there are some moments of improbability. Uh, sometimes in good farce, a disguise is used or there's mistaken identity. There is one moment early on in the play where there is a very critical point of mistaken identity that sets another set of dominoes throughout the play and creates another relationship. So keep an eye out for that little moment of uh, mistaken identity. In farce, and I'm thinking about this actually in conjunction, oddly enough, with Romeo and Juliet, because Romeo and Juliet, the first half of the play, has all of the elements of a good comedy, where it's feuding parents, young lovers in love, a rather obnoxious servant, um, and the play takes a very, obviously, a very dangerous and very dark turn. And this farce has that servant. Uh, Roberta serves uh, farcical servants. They know better than the people that they're serving. We all know that. Uh, they provide a very good conduit for you as audience members in terms of responding to the situation that's happening out on the stage. And they provide a lovely contrast to the person that they're serving. So keep an eye out on the relationship between, um, is that for me? No. Okay. Um, keep an eye out on the relationship between Bernard and, um, and Bertha. There are in this play puns and innuendo and verbal and physical humor. And I will tell you right now, it's a very clean French sex farce. It's very clean. There are some moments of, um, clean intimacy. I'll leave it at that. Um, uh, there is, in good farce, sort of a license for broad, exaggerated humor, and that relates a little bit to the set, which I'll get into uh, in a bit. And one of the things that I like about this play, and Brooke and I were talking about farce, uh, that the, it, it's a series of circumstances outside the character's control. Sometimes there are farces uh, say, for example, Ken Ludwig, who wrote Lend Me a Tenor, which we did many years ago here. That was a series of circumstances. He put the pills in the wrong liquid. The shrimp got, went bad downstairs. Uh, another guy came in, and it was all about circumstances. 
And then uh, Ken Ludwig wrote Moon Over Buffalo, which we did here. And he started to, Ken Ludwig started to break his rules of farce a little bit, which made it a challenge to produce and direct because he had it happen in three locations. It was a rehearsal for Cyrano, it took place in a green room backstage at a theater, and then we had to produce an onstage scene of Private Lives. And when you start going into that number of locations in a farce like this, it starts to distill the tension that you're trying to create with all of the characters. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the same with 24 hours. If you start going more than 24 hours, it distills the comedic tension and the pressure on that lead character or those lead characters to sort out the problem that has arisen, um, it becomes a little too easy the more time they have. So you always want a deadline of some sort. And then Ken Ludwig wrote Leading Ladies, which was a play that Brooke and I were looking at, and it's very, very funny, but it's driven by an act of meanness. Two guys want to cross-dress and dress up as nieces or distant cousins of a woman because they want to swindle her out of money. And when I read the play, and Brooke and I read the play, we said, this, is, this comedy should not be driven by an act of meanness. It's more effective in our minds if it's driven by just human circumstance and human coincidence. And we were talking during um, Romeo and Juliet where uh, if the little boy Peter could have read, there would have been no play because Capulet hands him the invitation to the party. He can't read, so he bumps into Romeo on the street and says, sir, can you read? And he says, yes, yes, yes. Oh, I'm going to go to that party. So I think Romeo and Juliet should now become a major literacy campaign because if you don't read, people can die. Um, there is, in good farce, um, an incongruity. And I heard a, a professor of mine years ago say, if you see a farmer slip on a banana peel and fall into some mud, you see somebody slip on a banana peel, okay, it's funny. You see a guy in a tuxedo, slip on a banana peel and fall into mud, it's much funnier because of the incongruity of the tuxedo and the mud and the mess of um, him falling into that. Um, so I think the more, and I think of like private lives where the more elegant and the more ordered and the more organized, and Bernard talks about how organized he is, the more elegant, the more opportunity you have for the chaos, the, the, the downfall becomes that much farther. Um, I won't say um, if he ends up with any of those three stewardesses. Uh, the journey along the way is certainly a lot of fun to find out if he does. And I think, bear in mind, that I was talking to the cast about this, bear in mind which stewardess shows up when? There is a morning stewardess who's there for breakfast, there is an afternoon stewardess who is there for lunch, and then there is an evening stewardess who is there for dinner. And when the play winds up, think about the morning, the afternoon, and the evening stewardess. Um, the set. We do have seven doors, and I have a very specific formula that I learned many, many years ago about it's very important to a comedy which way the door swings. <laughs> and a friend of mine, an old colleague of mine said, in comedy, the door has to swing open. In tragedy, the door swings upstage. And in burlesque, it swings both ways. <laughs> uh, so we do have all of our doors open on stage. And I will mention that we do have a burlesque door, a burlesque door that swings both ways. Um, and it, it is important to bear in mind that when a door opens on stage, if say the servant, if they open the door, there is a revelation. If the door in a tragedy opens upstage, it's more of a mystery as to who's behind that door. Does that make sense? So, um, and it was interesting that Romeo and Juliet balanced that comedy and tragedy where some of those doors swung upstage and some of those doors uh, swung downstage. Um, in talking to the set designer, Kim Powers, who I think did an absolutely lovely job, we talked a lot about uh, being in Paris in the 60s and the apartment itself having sort of an old world feel, but the appointments in the apartment, uh, in the flat, are um, 60s uh, uh, modern. 
and to, to make it a little bit more hip. And in laying out the floor plan, when you walk into the theater, there's an area here, obviously, an area here, obviously. So there's positive space here where you know if you see chairs, people are going to be sitting on those chairs. Um, if you start to see that kind of thing, this chair had best swivel. But there's a lot of negative space, which for me as a director and for the actors in the physicality of the show, this big area right here, there's a lot of stuff that happens right here. And sometimes uh, if I go to the theater and I see the relationship between negative and positive space, I'm always curious about what's going to happen in the negative space. And so this has provided a really fabulous uh, there are highways and byways for our actors to be able to use uh, these positive uh, spaces as, and negative spaces being able to pass through and maybe some things happening uh, in the center here. So I think Kim did a, a really lovely job and we wanted, to, we wanted to sort of suggest that Bernard thinks in black and white and that's why there is some of these accents where his organization with these timetables, these, and, and I should say that on this one particular day, he is cutting it close with his three stewardesses. But he's so ordered and rigid that it's, it's black and white. I've got it all taken care of. And then those three stewardesses show up, and they're all dressed in primary colors. And the boys uh, and Bertha, they're in muted colors, and we wanted, that's why the palette in, in the apartment, rather than some kind of rich jewel tone, we wanted to provide a canvas so that when those stewardesses come out, they pop. And they're in blue, they're in yellow, and they're in red. And it's very calculated as to why each stewardess is in their particular color. So bear that in mind when you see how the play, um, <coughs> how the play unfolds. Uh, there are no windows on the set, even though in the play he says it's a beautiful view in Paris. And our lighting designer, uh, in our discussions, we decided to keep the windows in the bomb areas, and he uses some lovely light gobos to suggest that, because we wanted that sense of containment for Bernard, because he's a little trapped with these three stewardesses. And Suffice it to say that some of them may show up unexpectedly and one doesn't know that the other one is there and, uh, and that kind of thing. So it, it, it um, provides a nice little caged animal kind of feeling for him. He really doesn't have a whole lot of places to turn to. And there are times when he comes on stage and he doesn't know who's in what room, which is delicious, I think, uh, for, the, uh, for the audience. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about casting because the casting of this play was different uh, than we've done in previous years and it had a significant impact in the process of directing the show. They were all handpicked by Brooke and I before we even started auditioning for the season. When we knew we wanted to do Boeing, Boeing, and I hadn't seen it on Broadway, I'd never seen the show before, I saw a production of it up at St. Mike's, which I'll talk about that in a second. Um, uh, we went right on to, I read the play, and I said, we want Tom Miller, we want Catherine Markey, we want Catherine Mary, we want Amanda, and we, the cast that you're going to see today, we knew back in late April, May. And we had to go to New York to do, because normally you hear about a show like this where we might get, on a show like this, some of the comedies, Lend Me a Tenor, we had 25 submissions for eight roles, 2,500 submissions for eight roles. Uh, oh, it's, it's pretty massive. Um, I, I think we had something like, I think we had something like 800 Juliets submit for Juliet. So we didn't ask people to submit for this. We do have to, by union regulations, have an open call in New York for actors that sign up for a time and they can audition for the whole season, but we knew who we wanted. And then we brought in, then we had another casting call solely for people who had been to Northern Stage before, sort of our friends and family favorites. And these six came in, read the roles, and just sealed the deal. We knew that this was the cast we wanted. What that did for me as a director, because I had worked with each and every one of them before, I knew their comic timing. I didn't have a stranger in the room where you go, well, how are they going to work with that? How are they going to, mm -hmm. Um, I knew their physical agility, and that is, when you see a play, it's pretty critical that these, all six of them have an athleticism 
that just buoys the play. And when you see how high these high heels are on these stewardesses, <laughs> and think about how fast and how quickly and what they have to do in those high heels. And it also, by having an opportunity to have worked with all of them before, um, it provided, when you walk into a rehearsal on day one with a new cast, you have to start creating a dictionary. And um, I think many of you have heard in Script Club or here where I start with my dictionary, that, that language between a cast specific unto that show, I start with what the dramatic center is. And this is that one word that drives a particular play. And I'm so sorry for those of you who have heard this before. Say, for example, uh, Hamlet is the dramatic center of Hamlet revenge. He wants the revenge of his father's death. And that one word drives the play, and it also helps to inform design decisions, performance decisions. If you did a Hamlet that was a revenge play, I would tell you that that is going to be a darker Hamlet than, say, if Hamlet was a play about justice. That Hamlet doesn't want revenge, he wants justice. If justice is that driving word, it's going to be a lighter looking play, in my mind, than a revenge play. So in talking with Brooke and in talking uh, to myself, as I frequently do, uh, uh, it, there was no question that this particular play, what drives this play, is concealment. There's seven doors. So concealment, Bernard does not want any of these other stewardesses to know about them. Um, Robert doesn't necessarily want, to know, want certain people to know who is behind what door. And when you have a dramatic center like concealment, then you look to what's the opposite of that word, and the opposite would be something like revelation. Then you have revelation and concealment, and that's how this whole, the engine of this play works. That's what those pistons are. It's constant, revelation, conceal, revelation, conceal, revelation, conceal. And in talking with this cast, we got to our dictionary very, very quickly. <coughs> they know what kind of director I am in the room, and the most critical, critical component between an actor and director in the room is trust. And I trust them implicitly. They trust me implicitly. They know I'm not going to make them look terrible in any way, shape, or form. That I am going to be able to provide basically a sandbox where they can play and they can fail big. And we don't even like to use the word failure, but they can, they can make choices and go to places. It, it, it would be interesting some year to sort of shoot a documentary of every rehearsal because the number of funny things that are not in this show now that happened two and a half weeks ago, it's interesting what we've decided not to use. It's kind of like a director once said to me, directing is like cooking. It's not so much the ingredients that you use, but the ingredients that you leave out. And so we were able to, and, and it was truly joyous, and was in, what was interesting is that Catherine Markey, who plays Bertha, she directed Boeing Boeing up at St. Mike's with Tom Miller as Bernard. He plays our Bernard with uh, Amanda Ryan Page, who plays the American stewardess, and with Catherine Mary, who played the Italian stewardess. So half of this cast has done the show before. Catherine Markey never played Bertha before, but she directed the play, and I got to tell you, Catherine Markey's a very, very smart, talented actor and director, and I was a little nervous about following her production of Boeing Boeing. But it never became, what we talked about it actually last night at the talk back, it never became an issue of comparing the productions. St. Mike's is a proscenium. This is a thrust. Um, there are different cast members here. When I called Catherine Mary and said, um, or I called her agent and I said, we want her to play the German, but I know she played the Italian this summer. She said, what? But I, I had worked with Catherine Mary in 39 Steps, where she played the German spy, she played the Scottish waif, for lack of a better word, and uh, the British woman that was sort of on the run with Hanne, and her German was just hilarious. And so I, I asked her to switch that role. So this cast, all but Conchetta, who plays the Italian, they all have, oh, and I guess Scott Cody, who plays Robert, they all had such a familiarity with the play, but it was very refreshing and delightful that they came in and said, page one, we're not going to do any kind of comparison. 
And there were only one or two times where I would say to um, Catherine, director to director, did this work? Did that work? And she would say, no, it never worked. And, I, and, I, and I'd say, okay, I'll, 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 I'll stop obsessing about that. So the ensemble that we have, and I, I really hope that this is something that, that you experience as well, it feels as though these guys have been working with one another for months. Where sometimes if you have new actors, it takes you until you get until the middle of the run that they start to congeal and start to really click. Whereas by the time we got to the first preview, these guys were really making this machine work in a very well-oiled way. Um, so is the casting in this way, I almost don't want to cast fresh again, ever again. I want one of the people that I've had before. Um, so, uh, what did, did, uh, oh, um, I had talked a little bit about this on uh, opening night. Horatio Walpole is a, uh, an 18th century, he was a, a writer, an antiquarian, a, a man of letters. And he said, and I heard this, I think back when I was in grad school, he said, the, this world is a comedy to those who think, and it is a tragedy to those who feel. And I think because comedy <coughs> is so finely structured, there are things in this play will, where you will see setups that don't have payoffs until later in the play. It's not like um, Neil Simon verbally, he'll have a setup verbally and then a payoff verbally happening right after that. Camelotti, he, he will, you'll see an actor put a prop down and then something happens to that prop and then a scene later that prop shows up again in a different light. And so you spend with the actors, we spend a lot of time working on this structure and it occurred to me, and I, I, again those of you who may have been at open, opening night, this cast taught me something about why I love the sound of laughter so much. You know that uh, James Lapine on the actor's studio, what's your favorite curse word, what's your favorite sound? I won't tell you my favorite curse word. Um, <laughs> but my favorite sound is the sound of laughter, particularly in a theater. And this cast taught me the reason why I love the sound. It's because something smart happen right before you burst out laughing. If you're, if you're thinking, which you have to do in a comedy, you have to sort of follow the setups and the payoffs and the structure and what's going to happen next, something smart, something recognizable, something clever, something witty has happened in that moment before. So laughter is a smart response to something that's just happened. Does that make sense? Um, I do, however, feel that a comedy is something that happens to an audience as opposed to something like Romeo and Juliet where you have to happen a little to the play, which I think in this day and age now, it's a nice thing we were just talking, Jay and I were talking before, um, before this lecture, that um, we're at a point now, and I got actually an email about the show where you don't want to hear for two hours anything political. You don't want to hear about the election. You don't want to hear about the economy. You don't want to hear about foreclosures. You want to see for two hours people being silly and getting themselves into terrible, funny situations and be able to laugh at them, with them, recognize something in yourselves, and have an opportunity to think about a little bit about how cleverly structured this play is. Um, because it takes place in 24 hours, because it takes place at, in, uh, in one location, it really doesn't have any excess to it. There's no fat on the, the meat of this particular play until it gets to the end. And I'm not going to give away the ending. Um, there is a moment at the very end of the play that is not in the script. And wrapping up a comedy, I think, is probably structurally the hardest thing for any playwright to do. Because once the dust settles, how quickly can you get through that denouement to get to the end of the play? And there are a few extra moments here that Camelotti, uh, they're not extra, but he has to button things up and it takes a little while and it feels like, okay, that's an ending, okay, no, that's an ending, and then the play ends. So we put our collective funny minds together and um, there is a way, when you, when you see the show, there are so many surprises and so many pops and so many surprises and pops that the ending of the play didn't surprise. 
So we put in a surprise for the Northern Stage uh, production, and I hope you enjoy it. Um, comedy. When I sat down with this cast, and they had done, all of them have done comedies with me, and um, I have performed with Catherine Markey, I've performed with uh, Tom Miller, um, that comedy is not funny unless it's truthful. And I start that with day one in my dialogue with the actors, that you can't do funny for funny's sake, it's empty. And I do believe that Bernard does love each of these women equally. And he just doesn't know which one, oh, he, he's, uh, he's got a little fear of commitment. He, he says to them, you know, they'll ask them, uh, when, when are we getting married, when are we getting married, soon, soon, sooner or later, sooner or later, and he just loves, he's in love with the fact that he's got fiancés because he says they're a lot easier than wives. Um, but you have to believe that he loves them equally. The word poly polygamy comes up in, a sh in, in the show in, in, in relatively a funny way, but, he does love these women, and Tom Miller being the straight man in the show and all of this happening to him, if he doesn't love them, then it's, it's kind of not attractive uh, for us to watch him go through all of this. So finding these moments of truth, and there are moments of great hilarity. These, these actors are such good, smart comic actors that one of my favorite words in rehearsal is, what if? Well, what if we did this? What if we did this with the beanbag? Wait till you see what happens with me. Uh, what if we did this? What if this happens at the door? What if this happens? And being able to make sure that that's always rooted in something organic so it's not funny for funny's sake. Um, I think that one of the dangers of farce is what I call farce fatigue for an audience. If it's constant and constant and constant, after a while, it becomes a little bit of white noise. I think this cast and this script have, and the structure of the script have done a really lovely job of uh, moments of great hilarity and then regrouping, and moments of great hilarity and then regrouping. Otherwise, if the show just does this, there's no roller coaster ride for you to follow along, if that makes, uh, if that makes sense. Um, the stakes in comedy, one of the things that I love that the, the higher the stakes get, and the more that goes wrong, the license you have for things to unravel in a much larger way. So in some of the moments in the play, they have possibly larger than life reactions to what they're seeing, but they are also doing it because if the last person on earth you expected to walk through that door, and you are doing a comedy, and you are doing a farce, they, a farce, they, well, may the farce be with you, <laughs> uh, they have that opportunity to physically go as far as they possibly can without going too far, which is absolutely a joy. And then, and then sort of figuring out um, how do we how do we make sure that it can go over the top without tipping the scale to, again, farce fatigue? Um, I, every comedy that I approach, uh, there are some universal truths that I subscribe to as far as comedy is concerned. Love and goodness will prevail at the end of the comedy. <laughs> if love and goodness did not prevail at the end of the comedy, then it's not a comedy anymore. The, the fun part about comedy and knowing that it's going to have a happy ending is how on earth are we going to get there? And that's where the fun is, is in that ride. Um, I think that we will recognize, and I just heard a statistic the other day, we will recognize ourselves in terms of behavior in the comedy. We hide from people. I've done it in the grocery store where you go, oh, I didn't want to talk to that. Uh, we lie, and I just heard a statistic that the average human being lies four times a day. Now, I know, right? And then I'm, I'm thinking, well, is it a lie when I tell somebody their ha new haircut looks really nice, but actually it doesn't? You know? um, they're usually white lies. They did say that in the statistics. Um, and we exaggerate. Um, I tease Brooke all the time because sometimes she'll say, um, well, you know, we had 60 people come and do this, and then two hours later it's 100 people. And then two hours later it was 125 people. Um, so we do have a tendency to exaggerate. Uh, oh, and getting back to this, the, the, the challenge for actors as the stakes raise and the behavior becomes quite outrageous, 
their, that challenge for them to hang on to the energy and bring it down. And energy on stage is a question of conserving it and a question of, of releasing it. And one of the geniuses of comedy who knew how to conserve energy and explode was Jackie Gleason in The Honeymooners. He, something would happen to him. And you'd see him just boiling, but nothing would happen, nothing, and he's plunking around, and he's doing this, and a little piece of trivia. If you watch The Honeymooners, and you see Jackie Gleason rub his stomach, it meant he went up on his lines, and the rest of the cast had to help him out. But he, yeah, you see him rub his stomach, that means he went up on his lines. And you see him, and you see him, and then all of a sudden you get, bang, zoom! So conserve, conserve, shoot it out. But then the actors, Jack Gleason, all the other supporting cast, then it's, how do we get all that energy back? And that's what's so lovely about a comedy and riding an audience in their laughter, because they shoot that, that energy out, and then the laughter comes back, and so the energy comes right back. And I think that energy manipulation is one of the most exciting things in this particular space, because you're getting it from three sides. And it's also fascinating when you get it from four sides, if you do it in arena, if you've gone to uh, North Shore. And I think that when you sit in the audience before the show starts and the house lights start to go to half and we hear you start to quiet down, your energy starts to get conserved and you see the lights come up on here and all that energy has come up on the stage and it's ours for the taking. And it's a question of really making sure that handoff, that relationship with you as an audience member, that relationship of conservation and energy expansion is, is a beautiful dance. Um, the tighter the structure, the tighter the structure in my universal truths of good comedy, the funnier the play, uh, the one location, the 24 hours. Because of, as the stakes raise, the relationship between the structure of the play and the physical universe will provide an arena for physical activity. <coughs> that is to say, um, when the screws start turning tighter and tighter on, it's almost like Bernard has, has a, a, a vice grip of, oh my god, the timetables are all crazy. Outside of that vice grip, everything is going like this, which is rather exciting for uh, the actors as well as, as the audience. Uh, one of my favorite universal truths of comedy, nobody will ever get seriously hurt. If they do, it's not a comedy. Uh, the audience, one of the interesting things about this show and farces is to what degree do you know more than what the lead character knows? What are you going to know that Bernard doesn't know, or that Robert doesn't know, or that the stewardesses know? And I think audiences love being in on the joke, and you get to say, rather than a character, you get to say, I know something you don't know and just you wait till that door opens. It's a, it's a delicious, delicious uh, quality of, of farce. Um, in, the, in the incongruity in producing this play, it became, it's such a lovely, lovely apartment. It became more of a challenge for us. The apartment doesn't fall apart, whereas I have had other shows where curtains come down and things get spilled all over the place and whatnot. This environment stays very, very clean, and the rest of the characters become more and more and more uh, unnerved. It's very interesting to see what energy comes out of that door when some of these doors get opened by various uh, characters. Um, so those are my uh, universal rules of good comedy. I feel like I've been my, my, my. Do we have questions? Bill? Yeah. Yes, sir. Would you comment on, on timing? Mm. And, how, and how, which obviously. Is I am so glad you brought but, that but up. How, and how do you affect that timing? You did mention the, the sort of suspension and then the explosion, but the, the, is this coming from, from you or do they instinctively do it? Is there good? It's a, com it's a combination of both, I believe. Uh -huh. And um, a lot of people think that comic timing is not something that can be taught. And I go back and forth on that. These guys have impeccable timing. And I think that they would say, me as a director, there are times where I go, if you just wait two more beats, you're going to get a bigger laugh. If your head goes like this on that word, you're going to get a bigger laugh. And I, thought, I think a lot about that. And I do think that um, timing, to an extent, can be taught with repetition. and. Uh, 
with my experience with comedy, and I, I, I think a lot about, well, where did I get this sense of comic timing? And, and other actors in Romeo and Juliet talked about some of the nurses' funnier scenes and the comic timing there. I hand to God, I do believe that growing up, I watched Dirty Kovacs, I watched uh, The Honeymooners, I watched Lucy, I watched Carol Burnett, all of those brilliant, brilliant uh, comics and, and comedians. And I saw my parents, I didn't know half the time why something was funny in The Honeymooners, but I sure saw my parents howling. And I think that watching, because we all used to, it was a really cute thing. I, I'm one of seven kids and we'd sit on the bed in my parents' bedroom on a black and white TV and watch The Honeymooners together. And to see my father, whether it was Ernie Kovacs or, or Jackie Gleason uh, or Lucy, and see my mom and dad laugh, I think I started to get a sense of, oh, because it happened then, that's what got the response. And timing is smart, you know. Um, if the timing isn't smart, then the laugh isn't going to be there. Um, it's, it's a... Um, it's a delicious dance with, I will use delicious all day, uh, with this particular cast. There is a moment um, where there, there are three lines that happen, uh, one character, another character, another character. And we had finally gotten on stage. And I, I will tell you, the first day on stage, and we only have two days to get really all the lights and the sound together, we spent three and a half hours just on the doors just on the going through the entire play and getting entrances and, and exits um, together. And the three actors that they had a line here, a line here, and then a line over there, and it was a door open, line, door open. And they said to me, you know what, we're not getting the one, two, three. And they were right. And I hadn't picked up on that. And then we probably spent another 10 or 15 minutes just on those three lines to go, oh, I have to hit the O, oh, and oh my God, by the time that door slams, so that by the time that door opens, my sentence is finished, and we can hear the line that's coming up next. I mean, that's, that's seriously the kind of thing that, that we have to do. Um, in, in timing, um, if, if an actor is standing at the door and has to uh, slam the door, exit and slam the door there there were times where it does it go like this well and then we spent a lot of time and that can't happen that can't happen in a farce because there's so much percussion that has to go with um, oh my god slam what are you doing here slam what happened to him oh the doors open and um, it, it becomes a really terrific percussion of the door slamming with the language and so these particular doors, because they do a little pop back, we had to spend time with the actors being able to, when they slam these two doors, they have to hold them for a second and then they can exit. <laughs> Whereas these doors, and it's, if, if, an act, if an actor is talking and they have to open the door, spending that time to go like this, so that then they can go like that. So they have to do the hand switch off on the door, which we never think about in our everyday life. We just go, okay, I'm gonna, and so it's gotta be nice and clean and that kind of thing. So timing physically as well as verbally and knowing what's the positive, and again, go to positive and negative space. Verbally, I think that's where timing is. How much air is in between a line or in between a word? How long can they hold when somebody has a look to someone or a double take to someone? How long can they hold? And the unknown for this cast every night is if they do the double take and they get the laugh from you guys, how long is that laugh gonna go? And what are they doing while they're waiting for the laugh to, ride, to die down? And they can't wait for the laugh to die, die down. It can't be ha, 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 next line. It has to be ha, 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 next line right on top of the ha, ha, ha. Um, so I think it's a, it's a long winded way of answering. It's a combination of me as director, them as being very smart comic actors, and them recognizing, oh, no, I, I, I've got to do this faster so that I can get to that faster, or no, let's slow this down a bit. Um, one of the questions that has come up since we've seen the preview audiences in the opening night is, Catherine, how long can I milk this? <laughs> you can milk it, but don't let the laughter stop so that we can keep it. It's like surfing. That's what, if, when the wave is coming around, you get that wave of laughter, and they're surfing, 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 and then it's the next line before that wave crashes, it's that kind of thing. Does that help? Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Where does the name come from, Boing Boing? 
because the Boeing, it was uh, the company Boeing that first introduced the twin turbo jets, and I think that's why it's Boeing, Boeing. There's nothing written about in the research about why they double the word. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the playwright said he could do that so he could say tickets are going, going for Boeing, Boeing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's because of the, these, these roles, they put a Rolls-Royce engine in the Boeing uh, uh, planes back in the early 60s. And so I, it's, it's, and Boeing, Boeing is funny. It's funnier than Pan Am, Pan Am. <laughs> um, Airbus, Airbus. Um, so. It sounds like Boeing, Boeing. It boing, sounds like boing, boing boing. In fact, there's been many misspellings of the show, boing boing. Um, yes, ma'am. Where does comedy let off or farce begin? That's a great question. That came up in Script Club. I believe that the level of improbability distinguishes what happens in a comedy versus what happens in a farce, and the, and a, and the willing suspension of disbelief. There are things that are happening in this apartment that it's like, come on. The, there's no way that no, somebody in the other room isn't hearing the screaming that's going on out here. Do, do you know what I'm saying? Um, and, and comedy has a little bit more of a realism to it, but it's that level of improbability that happens in a farce where you have to, as audience members, buy into that level of improbability because it's funny and it's fun. Does that make sense? It's less, it's less possible in a farce as opposed to, say, a comedy. Shayla. Could you say a little about, about the uh, physicality, particularly um, a couple of the scenes with the embraces, and did, were those yours or theirs or in the script? Or? Uh, the script has very little stage direction, which is very frustrating sometimes. <laughs> um, I wanted to make sure, and I think that the, the actors, it's something we never talked about, but I'm pretty sure we all wanted to make sure that Bernard has a um, very distinct physical relationship with each of those stewardesses. And the very first stewardess that kisses Bernard, um, some of you were at the script club, uh, and I had seen Amanda, who was the American stewardess, I saw her in Boeing Boeing this summer, and I said, you did this great thing with your legs, and then you did this thing. And, she said, oh, you want that? And I said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and then she and Tom, they're in the middle of this embrace. She and Tom started horsing around, literally in rehearsal, and the kiss turned into something very, very funny. I took it to script club, and I said, here's how the kiss normally goes. Here's how the kiss was when they horsed around, and everybody in script club voted for the horse around script, uh, the horse around kiss. So when that kiss started, then... Um, the next stewardess that came in, we decided that embrace would be a little bit different. And then by the time the third stewardess came in, Catherine Mary knew, oh, there is, there is going to be a different physicality. Um, and actually, she has a different, um, she has a different physical kiss with Bernard now because the one that she was doing before was pulling a stomach muscle. So we have to, <laughs> so we have to change that um, a little bit. Um, Tom is very experienced in fight choreography, and Scott Cody, um, Tom and Scott end up in a rather interesting physical position uh, at one point, and they're, they're very smart and, and very choreographed in how, A, how far do we want to go with this, how do we make this quick, and how do we make the joke land, and um, it was a great collaboration of how far is too far, can, can, can you smack her on the rump, can you do this, can we look at, and um, it's their physical agility, I think, that um, serves the play so very, very well, and we knew that, as I said, with them coming in. Um, and there are times where I think directing a comedy is almost more surgical than, um, than directing a drama, because you literally are saying, oh, if the hand, there, there was a moment where one of the stewardesses surprises uh, someone else with a kiss, and we discovered that the physicality before that kiss was telegraphing the kiss. Not unlike, um, if, if you remember when Mercutio kisses the nurse in Romeo and Juliet, and, and she's leaning, 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 that kiss came out of nowhere. He used to telegraph that kiss by sort of stroking her face, and, and Joe Tapper and I said, you know, it's not landing, and then we said, oh, it's gotta come out of nowhere. And Catherine Mary 
realized, oh, I'm telegraphing. And, and so uh, figuring out when you want to telegraph and when you don't want to telegraph. And, um, and sometimes we literally talk about, is, should my hand be like this? Or should my hand be like this? Should it be a fist? Um, it's, it's surgery. There's one moment in the play that's not in the script. There's a few. Um, <laughs> there's a towel bit that it took us 20 minutes to figure out what, what was going on with the towel and would that happen truthfully in this uh, particular moment. So um, it's, it's a give and take of physicality. And, um, and I, I consider myself a pretty physical actor. And I think that that sort of shows up when I'm directing the comedies. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Okay. Any other questions? Well, look, um, I was wondering whether you could comment on an old uh, comedy show, All in the Family. Yes. Which is negative. <coughs> is it a sign of the times, or is it comedy? Uh, I think it's absolutely comedy. You know the Norman Lear? Uh, sitcom All in the Family, Carol O'Connor, Edith and Archie, you know, that. Uh, they, they could never get away with that on television today. Absolutely not. Um, uh, Archie was um, uh, somewhat of a racist. Uh, <laughs> but you know what? African Americans kept showing up in his home. And, and I don't know that I would be articulate about this. But, uh, and that was a show that I watched. I, I remember that whole Saturday night, night lineup. It was all in the family. It was MASH, it was Bob Newhart, and it was uh, Mary Tyler Moore. And um, it's because I didn't go out in high school uh, and on Saturday nights. And um, uh, there, there is something about being able to laugh at him and the situations that he got himself into because of his language and because of his opinions and that Norman Lear provided a venue where Meathead, his, his son-in-law, was able to make these arguments with him in front of the American pub public in a, in a sitcom. Um, and you knew that he loved his daughter. You knew that he loved his wife very much, as, as much as a, of an airhead as Edith was. Um, and that whether or not he had respect for the Jeffersons, the black neighbors uh, next door, but they kept showing up at the house and they didn't get kicked out by any stretch of the imagination. And I think that what Lear was doing was teaching us something about ourselves. Um, what, what's interesting is how television has evolved that we couldn't get away with that show now. Uh, the censors would never, ever, ever go for it. And I don't know if that's because the writing isn't as clever that you could get away with it, or if we've just become so careful about pe being politically correct. Does that make sense? Well, Which is, you're, you're you want right to be? Hmm? You're right about that. You know, Disney can't re-release Song of the South, mm -hmm. the Brer Rabbit stuff, mm -hmm. because of the accent and the way the truth lies. And they had wonderful stuff in mm -hmm. well, there. Joel Channel uh, Harris was good. Uh, there's a big controversy right now about the uh, the uh, revival of Porgy and Bass, yes. uh, and yeah, Stephen Sy they're, they're reviving Porgy and Bass, and, and Diane Paulus is one of the directors of it, and they're making some adjustments to it. And Stephen Sondheim wrote a very very vocal uh, letter to the editor in the New York Times saying, "How dare you touch this masterpiece?" Um, and and sort of shift some of the what the um, what the race lines were at the time and shift them to accommodate a contemporary audience um, I you know it's part of our American history and it's something that we we can't forget and should explore on occasion as to what was happening and because I think we learned from history you know so um, that, that took an interesting turn <laughs> but, uh, but uh, it is hard it's, it's hard you know to, to uh, it's hard to look at political plays or look at historical plays. I remember we had a major debate in doing of Mice and Men and whether or not the N-word was supposed to stay. And we made, Brooke and I were unanimous in that decision that that's the word Steinbeck used and that's what we're going to do. Um, so, but that, that's a great question about All in the Family because that was pretty, it's like, wow. Other questions? Well, in All in the Family, it was, it was funny because he was so outrageous, 
-hmm. And it wasn't as if uh, the audience was racist looking. It's like they wouldn't have laughed at Right. It. It's because he, he was so exaggerated in, in a kind of way right. that we all knew was wrong, but still funny. And more often than not put in his place. Yeah, yeah. Whether it was by Meathead, whether it was by Edith, whether it was by his daughter, put in his place. And Norman Lear is a writer, he, he does that beautiful turn. I mean, who, who on earth would put in a sitcom about this racist guy that his, his uh, what, what did he call her? What did he call Edith? Dingbat. 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 Um, she gets raped. She got, do you remember that? She got, and it, uh, to, to do that kind of writing and to take that kind of turn. Uh, the same thing with Maud was a, uh, uh, a spin-off on that, uh, of All in the Family. And uh, her, uh, um, her, her husband, God will get you for that, Walter. Um, <laughs> remember that? God will get you for that, Walter. Um, he had a heart attack, and, and that was a Norman Lear show. He had a beautiful way of, of taking that turn comically. This, however, does not do that. To, there's nobody gets raped. Nobody has a heart attack. Um, so, um, like I said, it's fairly safe. Nobody gets hurt. Uh, you broke a glass at dress rehearsal. What's that? A glass breaking. Yes, Catherine Mary plays the German, and um, this actually you'll enjoy. So, there's uh, at the top of the second act, um, she's finishing uh, a meal, and she has a wine glass and. She plays a rather proud, strong German woman, and she took a sip of the wine glass, set it down, and the glass shattered. <laughs> Take a look at what prop we substituted tonight. Take a look at what prop we substituted so that she didn't, uh, so that she didn't break the glass. Yep. Um, that's also, you know, that's also that when things get really out of control physically and with, with props, um, the amount of calculation that we do do to make sure that things aren't going to break or get a little crazy, but Bertha came right out of the kitchen, swept up the glass, took care of the barn, the broom out, took care of it, so they all watch out for each other. Well, the kind of piece of the glass that was over there that he was lying on. Yeah, they had to be careful. Yeah. So, other questions? All right, well, I hope you all enjoy the show. Enjoy the show.